Hello. Welcome to a podcast on the law and its impact on computing technology and business. This is Brian Gaff. I'm a senior member of the IEEE and partner at the McDermott, Will & Emery Law Firm in Boston. The IEEE is presenting this podcast in conjunction with my column that appears each month in Computer Magazine, the flagship publication of the IEEE's Computer Society. That column discusses legal issues relevant to people in the computer hardware, software, networking, and service businesses. In the last podcast, I discussed some issues surrounding bring your own device, known as BYOD, a concept where employees bring their personally owned technology to their workplaces and use that technology in connection with their jobs. This podcast will discuss some intellectual property cases that are important in 2015. 2015 looks like it will be a year when there will be several significant court decisions in intellectual property cases. Those IP cases include patent disputes, copyright disputes, and trademark disputes. In this podcast, I'll focus on the patent disputes, which is the subject of my column in the April 2015 issue of Computer Magazine. There are three patent cases this year that are significant. The U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision on one in January. The other two will be argued before the Supreme Court in March 2015, and decisions should follow by June 2015. One of the most important parts of a patent infringement lawsuit is when the claims in the patent are defined or construed. The claims are the numbered paragraphs at the end of an issued patent that describe the invention in precise legal terms. Claim construction occurs midway through a patent infringement lawsuit and before the case goes to trial. The claim construction process involves each side, the patent owner and the accused infringer, submitting written briefs to the court that argue for particular definitions for the patent claims. Following the briefing, the court usually conducts an oral hearing where each side argues for their definition. This hearing is sometimes called a Markman hearing. Markman was the name of the case that established the claim construction procedure. After the hearing, the judge issues a decision on what the claims mean. There isn't a jury at this point. As the case proceeds, the judge's definition controls and dictates how each side argues their position. Sometimes the definition significantly curtails and might even end one side's argument. Because of that, a party who's unhappy with the definition typically appeals the claim construction to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. That's the court in Washington, D.C. that handles all patent appeals from U.S. District Courts. Some statistics show that the Federal Circuit reverses lower court claim construction about half of the time. In January, the Supreme Court ruled in Teva v. Sandoz that when the Federal Circuit hears an appeal on claim construction, it must give deference to the lower court's decision instead of taking a completely new look at the party's arguments. Now, that doesn't mean that the Federal Circuit will always affirm what the lower court did, but it does mean that there will probably be a lower rate of reversal, something lower than the 50% that has been reported. Consequently, parties will probably increase their already significant emphasis on claim construction to try to ensure that they get their preferred definitions at the district court level. Getting a second bite at the apple at the appeals court seems unlikely going forward. There are two other patent cases this year that are particularly interesting. One involves induced infringement and the other involves patent royalties. Let's talk about the first. Induced infringement occurs when someone persuades another to infringe a patent. This sometimes occurs if one person gives another instructions on how to use an item that's covered by a patent when the patent owner hasn't given his authorization to do so. To be liable, the person giving the instructions needs to know that the induced acts constitute infringement. Patent owners sometimes rely on allegations of induced infringement to sue manufacturers rather than suing end users. However, the Federal Circuit ruled that if the inducer had a good faith belief that the patent was invalid, then he wouldn't be liable for induced infringement. That decision was appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's decision will be a significant one. For example, if the court affirms the Federal Circuit, Allegations of induced infringement will likely be very difficult to prove. That's because it will be difficult to refute the good faith belief defense. The other case involves royalties. Patent owners can demand a royalty in return for giving someone a license to make, use, sell, offer to sell, or import into the U.S. an invention that the patent covers. 
However, the patent owner can't demand a royalty after the patent expires, which is usually 20 years from the date that the patent owner applied for the patent. Now, trying to collect a royalty on an expired patent is sometimes called patent misuse, and that's to be avoided. So if you're negotiating a license that covers multiple patents, it can be difficult to determine the end date of the license and royalty payments if the patents have different expiration dates. Also, things get more complicated if the agreement includes a license to certain non-patent IP that doesn't expire, for example, trade secrets or know-how. The Supreme Court was asked to hear a case about a license agreement that included patent and non-patent IP. The patent covered a toy that shot foam string out of a glove, and the patent owner licensed it and other IP to Marvel, the owner of the Spider-Man character. The Supreme Court will need to decide if the royalties paid to the patent owner ended when the patent expired, or whether they could continue because of the non-patent IP. Some commentators have expressed concern that permitting the royalties to continue will artificially extend the lifetime of the patent. Others have said that continuing the royalties will be economically advantageous. Because of the amount of money involved in licensing IP, this decision will likely have significant impact on companies that have active licensing programs. A decision on this case is expected in June 2015, and it should be very interesting, and I'm sure it's one that many companies will be watching closely. Now, in addition to patent cases of interest in 2015, there were a few copyright and trademark cases as well. Those are the subject of my next column and podcast. Until next time, this is Brian Gaff. Feel free to contact me via email at bgaff at mwe.com. Thank you.